The first thing that we have to understand or really shed light on is what is guilt and what is shame? What are these states of being? Because they're essentially not just emotions, they're deeper than emotions, right? Because when you feel guilty or ashamed, it starts to impact everything. It impacts your thoughts, it impacts your behavior, it impacts even your emotions. You start to feel in a particular way because you're guilty, because you're ashamed. So they're deeper states. They're states of the heart, not necessarily just states of the, the body or the states of the mind, but states of the heart. And that's why they have such a magnanimous impact on us. You know, think about a time when you did something or said something or behaved in a particular way where you wronged someone or someone that you really love, maybe you're one of your parents or a sibling or your spouse, and you said something and you felt so guilty for it, right? How much did that impact everything else? How you were thinking, probably how you were eating, how you were sleeping. And, and when you went to apologize and, and you know, finally come and, and speak about why you are guilty and, and, and look for forgiveness, you sense that relief, that not just the relief on your mind, but on everything, on your entire being. Even your prayers start to look different. Your eating starts to look different. That's why a person who has a broken heart, for example, you start to see it impacts all of the behavior, all of their emotions. So guilt and shame are very powerful states. But the thing that a lot of us are negatively associate to guilt, and this is where really you start to make the paradigm shift, you start to change the way you see guilt, is when we're thinking about guilt, we look at guilt between creation and creation, so between me and my friend, and we attribute that same guilt between me and God. See, if you do something wrong to someone and you feel guilty for it, and you go and you apologize, you expect them to forgive you, or at, at best you're expecting forgiveness. You're not expecting any more than that, especially if you repeat that action that you apologize for. You know, if you do something wrong to them, you apologize, they might forgive you, okay, all good, but then the next time you do it, oh, now they take a step back, what are you doing? So that there's a level of grudge, there's a, there's a certain fear of disconnection between you and the person. Whereas when you're conveying and when you're, you're, you're talking about guilt when it comes to you and God, it's not a guilt that is the same as between you and your friend. Because when you go to God, that guilt is a compass that takes you back to Him. The only reason why you are guilty is because there's a misalignment. I want you to think about this and be very, very conscious of this. When you believe in something, when you, you know, you think about something, you learn something new, let's say you learn that I, as a, as a Muslim, have to pray five times a day, okay? You internalize this information and you believe it. When you start to believe that, then your behavior starts to be impacted by that belief. So you start to behave in a way that shows that you believe that you must pray five times a day. So when prayer time comes, you pray. So you accommodate the belief with behavior. When you're guilty, it's when your behavior conflicts with a belief, with a thought, with a value, with a principle, your behavior is conflicting internally. So you feel guilty. So there's this displacement. So when you use this guilt, and a perfect example of this is, who, for those who are familiar with the story of Karbala, Hor. When you use this guilt to not take you away from God and take you to God, then guilt becomes constructive rather than destructive. Because if you're thinking, and this is, this is what sparked the conversation on Thursday night, right? One of the brothers says, when I'm sinning, I'm intentional about my sin. And when I'm intentional about my sin constantly, why would God constantly forgive me? So what it does is, over time, you start to decrease the guilt because you say the guilt either takes you to God and if it doesn't take you to God, what it does is you stop, you become desensitized. If I can't ask for repentance from this sin, God won't forgive me for it. No way he's going to forgive me for it. No way, I've done it too many times. He's never going to forgive me for it. So then you feel like, what's the point of me praying anymore? Because God's not going to forgive me for my sin. Might as well just stop praying because like nothing makes sense anymore. Not, there's no point anymore. 
So that guilt led you to this to the fact where you started to have despair, despair in his mercy. You started to limit the mercy of God. Now you might you should understand why now, or we'll explain it in a moment. But the reason is when you're limiting the mercy of God, what you're doing is you're slowly and slowly getting rid of the guilt again. So it's like you're going up and then you're going back down. Your guilt, then you eventually not care anymore. Your heart becomes solid. It becomes like a rock. And the Quran alludes to this, right? Where it, it speaks clearly that when a believer, when a person stops using the faculty of conscience, the fitra, when he stops using that, the, the faculty of guilt to bring him back to God, his heart becomes solid. When it becomes like a brick, you stop feeling. Now, in that state, you will not be able to experience happiness in anything because now there's a conflict in identity. Because the core beliefs and your, core, and your behavior are contradicting. So you live in a state of guilt. What you must do, first and foremost, is delete the question, what would God forgive me? Or why would God forgive me? Delete that question. Because the question is invalid. God will forgive anything. Absolutely anything and everything. All you have to do is go to. That's the simple frame. Imagine looking at the world with that lens. If I had a black dot on my lens right now, everything I see, I'm going to see that black dot. If I had the lens of everything, God will always have mercy on me. Then I must navigate through my guilt. I must use my guilt and go to God. And I have to be ambitious with what I'm going to God. Not only am I expecting Him to forgive me, not only do I believe that He's going to forgive me, when I approach Him with a, with a solid heart, with a broken heart, with a solid intention, I should say, and you go to God with sincerity, He will always answer. But you must not remove the option. For example, imagine this man, Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi in Karbala, right? Imagine, listen, look at the story, look at what he's done, okay? Imagine yourself in his position. He's the one that stopped Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, the grandson of the Prophet, from progressing. He stopped him. He told him and his family, and he stopped them from drinking water. So he denied them water, he separated them from the water, and he, he was the one in command of the army, waiting for all of the other soldiers to come. So imagine, and he's seeing all this, and he knows to the extent where he knows who the Imam is. He's telling him when, they, when prayer time came, he said, the Imam, you're the one that, you're the grandson of the Prophet, you lead the prayer. Even the enemy army prayed behind him because he knows. So belief, he knows, he's got the belief, but his behavior is contradicting that belief. As time goes, that guilt is getting stronger and stronger and stronger to the extent where on the last day, we all know what happens. A man standing next to him, and says, Hor, you're a commander, a general. You're one of the bravest, the fiercest warriors. What's happening with your face? Why is it going yellow and purple and green? What's going on? Listen to what Hor says. My friends, the journey of repentance, the journey of enduring guilt is all present in the next one or two minute story. Hor illustrates and Imam Hussain illustrates how the journey must be. Very simply, he says, firstly, Inni nafsi al nar. This is a big statement. He says, I am in a place where I'm choosing between hell and heaven. I'll tell you why that's significant. Because imagine you were in his position. We feel guilty for the sins that we commit, right? And then it pushes away from God, us away from God. Why would God forgive me? This man stopped and denied the grandchildren of the prophet from drinking water. The cause of the thirst. He was the one that stopped. Imagine the guilt he was living with. Yet he did not eliminate the option of heaven. He did not eliminate the option of divine mercy. This goes to show that why Hod repented and made that decision, uh, you know, I'm sure there was many people in the army of Omar bin Sa'ad that had a, a similar feeling. I hope there was, but the difference between all of them and Hor is Hor did not eliminate 
the mercy, the fact, the fact that God can and will be merciful to me. So what does he do? He doesn't stop there. And he says, and I will never choose anything over heaven. I will never choose anything over the mercy of God, over the love of God. So with all that guilt, imagine that ride, that horse ride to the Imam. He's now riding to the Imam Hussein with a broken heart. And the, 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 the narration state, the state he was in, the guilt he was in, he was crying, he was breaking down. He arrives and he doesn't go and start making excuses. He goes straight to the feet of the Imam. And he says, Ya Imam, second lesson. What is the state you should go to, to God in? Firstly, you must recognize that God will forgive you. Secondly, the state that you go to God is in a state of sincerity, of brokenness. You know, depending on how big your sin, the bigger the reaction it's going to be, the bigger the guilt that's going to be. But it does not mean that you don't go back. And when you go and when you arrive at the feet, for example, in Hur's case, at the feet of Abu Abdullah, metaphorically for us, when we arrive to God, on that prayer mat in Laylatul Qadr, we take absolute accountability. He says, Oh Abu Abdullah, I am the one that did so and so. I did so and so. I did this and I did that. I am the one that caused one, two, three, and four. I am the cause of the thirst of your children. I am Hor. Please forgive me. Allow me. Allow me to be part of your army. So he takes full ultimate accountability. Then he follows through. What does the Imam do? Instantly, instantly, this is Imam. Now, the Imam is a significant character for us. You know, he's the Imam. He's the grandson of the Prophet. He's an infallible. And he embodied the divine mercy in the moment. He said, I forgive you, Yahor, get up. Rise, be, pri be, be proud. Put your head up, Yahor. And so he did. But what did Hor say? Now, I want to say, if Imam Hussein salam, is going to embody this mercy, imagine the creator of the Imam, the one who his mercy fulfilled everything. So what is he going to do? Of course, he'll be forgiven. My sin is nowhere near the sin of Hor, Hor ibn Yazid al riyahi Yet Hor follows through. And this is crucial. And I'm going to end with this. And inshallah, if this is an interesting topic, I'm more than happy to make a part two. Please feel free to let me know somewhere below. He follows through. He says, Oh Abu Abdullah, let me be the first Marty in your army. He follows through by saying, I want to follow through on my repentance with action, with behavior. I want to make a change. I want to make a shift. So then he chooses the behavior that's aligned with his beliefs. He's overcome the guilt. What does the Imam say? He says, you are going to reach the highest of levels of heaven. One moment. One moment changed his life. And I know you know this story. We all know this story, but what does it embody? It embodies that my guilt can be constructive. It could be destructive. And you do not want it to be destructive because God is not like my friend. God does not hold grudges. God knows you're going to sin. He just wants to know how are you going to come back to him? Are you going to have despair in his mercy? And are you going to overcome your guilt? It's up to you. You want it to be constructive. Firstly, acknowledge that everything begins in the name of God. Everything ends in the name of God. And that his mercy fulfills everything.